and welcome to my week in books. I am Navessa Allen, published author and co-blogger on the Illiterates book blog. It is Sunday, April 19th, and here in my state we are 17 days into lockdown, which means that I have had a lot of extra time on my hands. I know a lot of people are on pandemic overload right now. It seems like we can't escape it no matter where we go, whether it be in YouTube or podcasts or our favorite bloggers, everybody is talking about it. And while I think that that's important, I also think that it's important to take a break from everything. So today, I'm going to skip over what new life is like for us, and I'm going to focus instead on something positive. And that is My Week in Reading. The first book I read was The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. This book was written in 1989, and it's one of those books that everyone has heard of, everyone has added to their TBR under some sort of shelf name like Books I Should Read, and everybody glances over in favor of the latest book that's coming out that all of their favorite YouTubers are hyping. I'm not judging you here. Don't worry. I'm guilty of the same. I picked up a pristine first edition of this at a local rummage sale last year and had the foresight to put it on top of my dresser which serves as a sort of physical TBR, reminding me of all the books that I should read before going on another one-click binge on Amazon. It's interesting the way that stress can affect our lives. So many of my bookish friends are turning to fluffy rom-coms to see them through the pandemic, and I get that. Rom-coms are escapism at its finest. But I tried reading one two days ago, and I just... I couldn't. For some strange reason, I've been drawn to grittier books instead. Thrillers, Grimdark, and now <laughs> The Joy Luck Club, which is ironic because it literally has the word joy in the title. That's not to say that this is some heavy, depressing read. There is a lot of joy in this book, but there's also a lot of hardship. This book centers on four Chinese women and their daughters. The mothers are immigrants, the children born in the United States. Like I said in the beginning of this, this was released in 1989, but I feel like it's still very relevant today. And because of the lack of pop culture references and the daughter stories, it reads like it really could have been written today. I googled this book after finishing it, and I was surprised to see there was so much backlash against it. People painted Amy Tan as being racist against her own culture, and of denigrating Asian men because they were negatively portrayed in this book. It's important to point out that they weren't all negatively portrayed. Some of the male Asian characters were incredibly kind, strong, and steadfast. As a side note, white men were equally shitty, if not more so, and a lot of the women were just as problematic as the men. In short, they read like real people. And that's because this author based the book on her mother's stories. Here's the thing that modern readers really need to know before they write this off, based on some old negative reviews or angry Reddit threads. This book is loosely biographical. Tan's experiences are not going to be the experiences of every Asian American. The Joy Luck Club had a huge burden to bear when it was released. It was an incredibly popular book about Asian Americans in a time when there was very little representation. The same goes for the movie, which put the onus of representing an entire people on one person, and more importantly, one woman of color. Even today, women of color are expected to go above and beyond and be absolutely perfect in every single way to get a seat at the table. Yes, we are making headway, and yes, a larger percentage of the population understands that women of color are just as fallible and varied and complex and flawed as everyone else. But there is still so much progress to be made. So is it any wonder that back in 1989, Amy Tan was made a pariah? As I record this, Asian and Asian American representation is increasing, in the young adult fiction category especially, not to mention blockbuster movies like Crazy Rich Asians. Reading The Joy Luck Club now will likely only be one of many stories about Asian Americans for readers, instead of the one. Is this book flawless? No. Are there some legit criticisms to be made against it? You betcha. The same can be said for all books. I am not in any way, shape, or form saying that people are not allowed to criticize this. But, in a broader sense, I feel like it's time people forgive Amy Tan for not being perfect. Next up, I read Beach Read by Emily Henry, which is a contemporary romance from Berkeley that comes out May 19th. We were lucky enough to get an advanced reader's copy of this on NetGalley from the publisher, but it should be noted that it in no way influenced this review. I feel like we need to talk about marketing in the book world. I requested this book because it had a bright, fun, illustrated cover with two people on beach towels seemingly ignoring each other. Between that and the blurb, I thought that this was going to be one of those antagonistic relationships that slowly evolved into something more. 
And then there were the media packages for Beach Read, hyping how much of a fun, upbeat summer romance it is. I have to say, all of that combined led me astray, and I think that many readers are also going to be confused when they open the book and find that their expectations of it are not going to be met. They might get 75% of the way into it, like I did, and think to themselves, this entire story is set in a beach house, and the one time these two a-holes actually go swimming is in a pool? Seriously, I think they only went down to the beach together twice in this entire book, So that cover with two people casually reclining on towels and seemingly ignoring each other is a bit of a stretch. From the book blurb, you might assume that this is about rival writers pitted against each other, filled with one-upmanship and witty banner. And yes, I did laugh out loud several times while reading this, but for the most part, this isn't what I think of when I think of fluffy rom-coms, because a lot of the book is spent on the main characters researching a notorious cult from the area, the head messiah of which locked all his followers into trailers, and then burned them to death. So fun! Aside from that, I had some serious issues with the male lead here. He went from aloof and quasi-grouchy in the beginning to over-the-top cheesy by the end. I also didn't appreciate the fact that once their relationship evolved from friendly into something more, he started making all the female leads decisions for her. You know, doing that thing where sometimes men try to save you from the world. Don't come with me, you'll get cold and wet! Oh, I didn't invite you because I didn't know if you'd have fun. Let me carry that heavy bag for you, even though you're not struggling. To me, there's nothing chivalrous about a guy suddenly assuming that I can no longer make my own goddamn decisions just because I let his penis near me. All this said, I did enjoy quite a bit of it. And while I didn't love it, it might have something to do with what I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, which is my inability to consume any type of fluffy media. So this ended up being a three-star read from me, and you should probably take that with a grain of salt. There are several other very critical reviewers who I am friends with who absolutely loved this and said that it was exactly what they needed in this day and age. So I still recommend it, but just go into it aware that the description and the cover are not exactly the most representative of this actual story. Lastly, I read The Wives by Taryn Fisher, which was my December 2019 book of the month pick that I am just now, in April, finally getting around to. This book is a thriller, and while I don't necessarily read a lot of thrillers, after reading this, I think that I'm going to change that fact, because I enjoyed it immensely. My god, does Taryn Fisher know how to open a story. From the very first line, I was hooked. Listen to this. He comes over on Thursday every week. That's my day. I'm Thursday. The best way to describe this is compulsory. Like a train wreck, you can't look away. I finished it last night, and since then, I've been reading back through my notes and wondering, how the hell do I review this without including spoilers? I think the only way to do that is to remain as vague as possible. From the blurb, you know that the main character is only one of the wives of her husband. He grew up in a polygamist family, and if that experience has taught him anything, it's that he needs to keep his wives separated. Look, I've read a lot of super judgy reviews about that aspect of the book, but for me, it wasn't an issue. I could give a shit about how other people love each other. And weirdly, I actually got it. Thursday's husband, Seth, was well written. He was gorgeous and charming and somehow sexy as all get out, and he really seemed like he truly loved each of his wives. And it should be noted that all of the women agreed to this arrangement. It was consensual polygamy. But then Thursday finds a note in her husband's pocket with the name of one of his other wives on it. Curiosity is part of human nature. We get ourselves into all sorts of trouble because we just have to know things. The same is true for Thursday. Once the Pandora's box is opened, there's no getting her newfound knowledge back in. And when a troubling pattern to Seth's behavior towards his other wives begins to emerge, she falls fully down the rabbit hole, dragging the reader with her. Halfway through the book, everything suddenly goes sideways. And what I thought was happening might not have really been happening? Or was it? Was Thursday an unreliable narrator? Or was she being gaslighted by Seth? I spent the second half of the book wondering which one it was, or if it was a combination of the both. And even though I guessed at some points of the plot, it made this book no less compelling. 
Taryn Fisher hit the ground running on the very first page and set a brutal pace throughout the story. There is zero downtime here, no point in which the narrative got too heavy or the dialogue dragged. Every single chapter, every single sentence felt like it was infused with urgency. I had to know what happened next. The only thing that almost kept this from being a five-star read for me was the very last page. This book ends in a somewhat over-the-top manner that didn't seem to fit with what had immediately preceded it, which is fine. I mean, I get it. Go big or go home. Ultimately, I decided to give this all of the stars because I am still thinking about it and I have a feeling that I will be for weeks to come. I cannot wait to see what Taryn Fisher puts out next. She is definitely going on my auto buy list. And that is it for my week of reviews. All in all, I think it was a pretty good reading week for me. You know, I mean, two books that I absolutely loved and one that I was kind of meh about is, is a pretty good record for me. I'm usually a much harsher critic and much more difficult to please. So I either picked good books this time or I got lucky. If you want to read more of my reviews, you can check them out at theilliterates.com. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.